Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because that foundation is on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Please be seated and remain seated for the worship team.
for this place. We're thankful for the preaching that will come from Catholic Father. Let it seep into our hearts and our heads and let us leave here a different people. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
uh, will get a fair share. Even people that aren't here, Marta's concerned. I just like, she's, she's like, what are you doing? We didn't talk about this. <laughs> We're also going to share with a lot of people that aren't here, people that we don't know, people that we will see someday in heaven. And the reason why is because I'm referring to one of those paychecks um, that God gives us when we stay faithful, when we stay in ministry, and we keep living for Him. And the working with youth dynamics and coaching and I've shared this before, we don't always get to see the fruits of our labor when we're planting seeds in hundreds of high school students' lives and then they leave. Most of them we never hear from again, a few we stay in contact with. But Friday night, I went to the store after practice and uh, I just grabbing some things for dinner and grabbing dinner from Annie's next door. So I, was, so I was walking from, stay with me, you all got so distracted just when I said Annie's. <laughs> Everybody instantly got hungry, like right, right then. Um, so I'm walking from the store over to Annie's, and uh, this lady approaches me, holding a baby, and she says, Kevick, do you remember me? And before I could even say her name, um, she told me she told me who she was, and she said that, uh, and I recognized her. Um, she came to Youth Dynamics and played basketball for me 20 years ago, and I had not seen her since. And within the first few seconds, the first thing she said is, "Kevin, I need to apologize to you," and I'm like. Or what? It's great to see you. <laughs> and she said, because I quit basketball. And I've always felt bad about doing that. I said, well, you were going through a really rough time in your life, which she was. Her dad had just been, um, just months before that, had been killed in a motorcycle accident. Um, her mom was really struggling, and her and her brother were trying to do the best that they could. And they ended up, she ended up dropping out of sports, she kind of hit a rough spot in her life, and then she ended up moving and moved down to Cedar Woolley, and then I never saw them again until Friday. And she said, the second thing I want to tell you is that I found Jesus. And that's the paycheck I'm talking about. Um, that's, one, that's one of those eternal paychecks. And she proceeded to tell me about how two years prior that she had accepted Christ into her life and it had completely changed her, her husband, she has three children, had completely changed their lives. So much so that she um, was able to introduce her brother to Christ um, the next year. And the, the beauty and the tragedy of that story is that her brother, um, died of kidney disease uh, earlier this year at the age of 33. Um, but he had just months prior accepted Christ into his life for the first time because his sister had led him to the Lord. Seeds that were planted 20 years ago finally came to fruition. And that is not random. That is the hand of God. Now I just had this, I mean, that's, that wasn't part of my sermon. I just had to share that with you all. Because I think stuff like that is really cool. And it all points to a Savior. It all, it all points to Him. And so i got to give credit where credit is due. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the realness of God. But let's, let's pray before we get into this. God, I just want to thank you for being real. I want to thank you for being real in my life and the lives of so many, um, so many that are here, and being real in the lives of of that young lady that I had the opportunity to run into on Friday. And I know that that was your divine intervention, God. And I just thank you so much for that encounter. It's just inspiring. 
and you are inspiring, and your realness is inspiring, and the fact that you, you love us so much, that you care for us so deeply, um, that you call us your own. God, may we feel the realness of that, that compassion and that kindness and that love this morning and every day. In your name we pray, amen. No one, please don't help me to mess up whatever you want to say. I always, I saw my biggest fear, I was telling my daughter Elise on the way here this morning, my biggest fear is messing up whatever God wants you to hear. Um, so hopefully I don't do that. So the realness of God, and the reason why I, I kind of chose this topic this morning is because Youth Dynamics starts a week from tomorrow. Uh, we always start the last Monday of September, Youth Dynamics, for those of you who don't know, um, we're just a nonprofit uh, youth ministry group. Uh, we meet every Monday throughout the school year with high school uh, students, uh, local high school students, and we do a whole bunch of different fun games and activities, and then we do different retreats throughout the year. Um, we have like winter retreats, summer retreats, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of students that attend. There's a lot of kids excited about, about next Monday, and we're very excited to see what God has in store for this school year. So if you haven't started praying for YD, for concrete, for this school year, you may begin today. <laughs> um, but the reason why I bring this up is because I already know that the realness of God or questioning whether God is real or how do I know that God is real or Kevin, how do you know that God is real? I already know that those questions are going to be verbalized out loud and I know 100% of the time that they're going to be internalized by every single one of those students at some point this school year. Those kids are going to, as a result of coming to YD and hearing the gospel, are going to say or think, I wonder if God is real. And they might think that a lot as they lay their heads down at night. That's usually when we do a lot of thinking, and that's typically when they will do that. And then some of them are going to be bold enough to say to either me or another staff person or another student, um, how do we know? How do you know that God is real? So if someone were to come ask you that, if you knew the same thing that I knew, and the fact that somebody that you lived with, worked with, associated with, that you are guaranteed, 100% guaranteed to be asked at least once in the next 12 months, how do you know? How do you know that God is real? What would your answer be? How could you convince them? Could you convince them? What would you say? It's all stuff that we should be thinking about if we haven't already. Because if people aren't saying it, everybody's thinking it. Especially the minds of teenagers. So the first place that I tend to go to, um, that I have tended to go to with students, and just let me get to, see I'm messing it up already, um, is, is creation. Because for me, uh, as a young man, um, and somebody who loved to get out and hike and, and go camping with the family and things like that, um, when my parents would point to creation, it was easy for me to grasp that. Um, we've all heard of some, of, some of us have heard of the wristwatch analogy. If you were to be walking out in a field somewhere and you were to find a wristwatch laying out in the field, you would assume, based upon the intricate details of a wristwatch, that that didn't just appear on its own or create itself. That had to have a maker. If you were to look at how everything is so tightly and neatly fit together, you wouldn't just be like, well, God obviously just grows there. <laughs> no, you would, you would assume automatically that that has 
a creator, somebody who made that watch. Well, there is far greater design um, in the precision of the world around us than a simple wristwatch. So if we're going to give credit to the creator of a watch, all the more do is giving credit to the creator of the earth that we live in or that we live on. Simple things, and there's so many things, so many directions you can go with this, but simple things like the rotation of the earth. How many of you remember merry-go-rounds? And I say that because they don't have them anymore. They took them all away because they're unsafe, because they spin too fast. But they were so fun. Even when you fell off at high rates of speed, they were really fun. I remember getting a lot of buddies and we, would have like the designated ones that your turn to ride and you have the designated ones, multiple ones, not just one, the spinning the thing as fast as you could possibly go. And you always knew the person with the weak stomach, they stayed right in the middle. <laughs> and you always knew your friends that had a couple screws loose because they literally hung out over the side. <laughs> There's a reason why they took all those out of the playgrounds. Right? And I think, how fast were we going? Well, it felt a thousand miles an hour. But did you know that right now, you're all spinning at a thousand miles an hour? And yet we're comfortable, we don't even feel it. On the Earth's axis, every it goes around 24 hours at a thousand miles an hour. Because we're spinning, there's light, there's darkness, temperature, humidity, tides, our weather, everything is affected by just the simple rotation of the Earth. And the Earth axis is not straight up and down. It's at a slight angle. And if it was half a degree one way or half a degree another, we would either burn to death or freeze to death. A little bit more intricate than a watch that requires a creator. Doesn't the world also require a creator? Something really cool, too, that I learned is that the highest tides is when the, the sun, the earth, and the moon are all in direct line with one another. That's when you get the highest tides. Oh, something to take on there. <laughs> Point is, the universe displays great design and argues for a great designer. Another argument is our DNA, and I think this one is probably the most mind-boggling. Every person in here has a different DNA code, and that code is stamped in every single cell of your body. Think about that. Every single person is different right down to the cell. There's 8.1 billion people on the face of the earth that all have a different DNA code stamped on every cell of their body. How many people have ever lived? I don't know, 100 billion? And yet each person has a separate DNA code? Except for identical twins, right? They're like, well, not us, we're the same. Well, you, you have different fingerprints. Doesn't that point to a designer and a creator? How could, it, how could it not? So we go to creation, we go to things like that to prove God. I hear people say all the time, a mountaintop is where they feel the closest to God. The night sky full of stars, standing on the edge of the ocean on the beach and looking out over the vastness. All that stuff points to a creator, a sunset, a sunrise all points to a creator. Not only has God made such an intricate and finely tuned physical world, he has also instilled a sense of eternity in our hearts. For since the creation, this is Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Isn't that cool? I remember asking the question when I was a kid, what, happened? what about people that never hear about God? They see him. 
in everything, in nature. It's all around, it's all around us, without excuse. Um, Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. It doesn't say the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands to Christians or to those that believe in him. No, to everybody. It's this innate sense that he puts us puts into us. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity into the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He's even set the truth of eternity, of an eternal God, into our hearts. As humans, we are born with an innate sense that there is something greater than us. It's unfortunate that most people spend their entire life suppressing it and fighting it and ignoring it because that's what they're doing. They know it to be true. They know God to be real because it's instilled in you from birth. But they choose to fight it instead of face the truth. Our sense of eternity manifests manifest itself in at least two ways, lawmaking and worship. If you look back through the, all the history of civilization, every civilization ever has had a valued moral law. And all, I mean, there's differences, but all have similarities as well from culture to culture, from country to country, from century to century. One example of that is the idea of love has always been universally esteemed. Everybody agrees that love, love is a good thing. Yeah, we like love. People should love each other. That's great. I think everybody agrees with that. While the act of lying has always been universally condemned. Lying's bad. We shouldn't lie to each other. That's not good. <coughs> universally good and universally bad, there is moral law that has existed since the beginning of time. Again, that points to a moral and supreme being. The common morality, uh, global understanding of right and wrong points to a god. In the same way, cultures all over the world always have a system of worship. The object of that worship may vary, but there has always been an undeniable, in every culture, anywhere, ever, a recognized higher power. There has never been a culture that has existed without it. Going back to what we said as far as the witness of creation, that's why God instills in you the realness of him surrounds you with all of his examples of him, it's easier to believe that every culture of all time has always had, uh, has always worshipped a higher being or a higher power. Number two, so that's creation, the realness of God. Number two is his word. God reveals himself through his word, the Bible, throughout scripture, the existence of God is treated as, self, as a self-evident fact. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. It does not spend any time trying to prove where God came from. In the beginning, God. If you've ever read an autobiography of anyone, ever, they do not spend the first paragraph or the first chapter of the autobiography trying to prove that they are a real person. They immediately start into the story of their life. Why? They don't need to. It's their autobiography. The Bible is God's autobiography to us. 
in the beginning, first sentence of the first chapter, in the beginning, here I am. I'm God. Here I am. Well, wait a minute. Like, who are you? Where did you come from? Oh, here I am. And things are about to get real. Likewise, God um, doesn't have to, he doesn't have to prove himself in the Bible. Um, he, he is the Bible. He is the Word of God. Proof of existence is in the life-changing nature, similar to what we see throughout the Bible, but what we still see today. And a young lady that I stood in the parking lot with on Friday, there was real life change, and I could see it in her. I could, I could look her right in the eyes and see this is a completely different person than the one I knew 20 years ago, but she's got the same eyes and the same face. But there's something really different about her. And it's undeniable. The integrity of the word and the fact that the Bible has never, ever been proven wrong. It's been tried a lot. And people continue to fail. And all the miracles that are pointed to in God's word as well. Number three is his son, Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6 through 11, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. If you just, if you would just, Jesus, if you just show us the Father, well, then we would believe. And Jesus answered and said, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Powerful. Through his Son, Jesus Christ, his proof of existence was real as in right in front of their faces. They could reach out and touch, physically touch God. And yet, what did they say? Well, if you would just show me. Just introduce me to your Father. And Jesus' amazing life, he kept the entire Old Testament Got to get there. He kept the entire Old Testament law and prophecies perfectly fulfilled. In Matthew 5, 17, said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have come, um, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament has come true, came true, and continues to come true. There's not one that hasn't. Um, in John chapter 21, 24, and 25, uh, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If, if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Jesus performed countless literally countless acts of compassion and miracles that authenticated God's message. So many so that it says that if they were all recorded, that the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. And then in 1 Corinthians uh, 15.6, it says, After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living. Who was he referring to there? Three days after Jesus was crucified. He rose from the dead.
That fact alone not just proves God's existence, but proves God's undeniable love for us, that he would send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. But he rose from the dead, and it says that over 500 people witnessed him three days later. That's, that's not one person who might have saw something. That's 500 eyewitnesses of a resurrected Christ. The historical records abound with proof. The Bible abounds with proof. Creation abounds with proof. And yet, I've had all those conversations with people, with high school students. I've pointed to creation. I've pointed to God's word. And I've pointed to Jesus. I've heard a lot of things in return. Anything from evolution theories to, again, suppress the truth that they know within them of Creator God. I've heard that the Bible, that this book, I was told multiple times while I was in college that I would carry this with me to every class. And I was told multiple times by students and professors that I have carried with me a book of fairy tales. And when I talk about Jesus and the nature of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus, the consistency of Jesus Christ, and the proof that Christ not only lived, but that he died and then lived again for us, I'm rebuted with, you know, he's just, he, was, he was just a man. And he's, he's dead now. But he's a historical figure. I'll, I'll give you that credit. Three really good things to point to. I think there's a lot of evidence that backs up all of them. Creation, his word, Jesus' life. And as you have those conversations with people that say, but Kevin, how do you know that God is real? And you point to creation and you point to his word and you point to the life of Jesus, which I've spent a lot of time doing. And I point to those things over and over again. What, what are they looking at? When I'm pointing in all those different directions, pointing to absolute truth, pointing to things that I know are absolutely real in my life. They, they can't, they can't grasp it. They can't grasp creation, they can't grasp this book of fairy tales to them that's not real to them yet. Jesus is not real to them yet. So the fourth and final realness of God, proof of the realness of God, is you and me. I think some of you knew I was doing that. Have a key point to creation, and you point to his word, and you point to Jesus. But I'm watching you. How are you living? Are you living how you're talking? Are you living for the Jesus that saved you? Are you living according to his word? Do you have a personal relationship with the Creator God? Because if all those things are true, I want it to show up. I want it to show up in your life. 
I want to see that realness of God. I want to see that realness of God in you. And then maybe we can have another conversation. Again, if they're not saying that out loud, they're thinking it. If you're bold enough to stand for Christ and to proclaim the name of Christ, they're thinking it. They're watching it. Real people made in the image of a real God. What does a living what does living a real life for a real Jesus look like? Well, I can tell you what the Bible says. In first Peter four, seven through eleven it says this. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. There we go, back to the word love. We can all universally agree that love is good. But love is not love. God is love. Are we demonstrating that? Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Again, offer hospitality to one another. Be nice. Be kind. And do it without grumbling. Yeah, it says that. I'm reading it. <laughs> like, I didn't just throw that in there. It actually says, without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received, and you all have at least one gift as a coach. I talk to my players all the time about this working with high school girls, getting them to believe that they are good or gifted at at least one thing is sometimes the hardest thing for them to believe. But you all have at least one gift. Use that gift that you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do, um, do so as one, as one who speaks the very words of God. So when you're speaking to those people that are watching you, make sure that you are speaking in a way that reflects the word of God. If anyone serves, I love that word, we're called to serve, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised. Through Jesus Christ, to him be all the glory. That's how we should be living in order for others to see the realness of God in us. On September 4th of 1982, I was convinced by that realness of God. And at the age of six years old, when I laid in my bunk bed, I asked Jesus to come live in little Kevick's heart. Now you could say, well, you were only six. How much did you understand? What did, how much did you know? How much had you already done so wrong that you, by the time you're six, where you needed a savior? Enough, I can tell you enough. <laughs> But I can tell you that even at the age of six, and I've never thought that, I think back to that, is that there was a change on that day. And that change on that day has kept me in check ever since. That wasn't a fake prayer to a fake God, and I knew that at six years old. I meant every single word I said when I laid in that bunk bed. I really did want God to forgive me of my six years of sin. I really did want a real God to come live in my real heart and change my life. And I knew it. And I wanted that. And it was real. And I felt it. And I have felt it every single day since. That relationship meant something to me. And it still does. I know that I'm, I wasn't perfect then. I'm not perfect now. 
I've made a lot of mistakes then, and I still make mistakes, and I know that. But I could tell you that there was something different, and I knew that God was in me at a young age, because when I went to school, I knew that there was something different about the way that I lived and the way that I talked from other kids. And I knew that God was real even inside of that little cabin. I knew he was real. He still convicted me to live right and to do the right thing and to love and to not lie. I remember show and tell, I think it was first grade. I love show and tell. Any excuse to get in front of the classroom. That's how I looked at it. Like, I didn't even care what I was bringing up there. A lot of times I was completely unprepared. And I would just grab something, like, out of my desk. And just, I mean, it could be anything. But it was a chance for me to get up in front of my class and talk. And I remember one morning I was heading out of the house, and I was like, oh, it's show and tell. I have no idea, like, what to grab. And on my dresser was a little New Testament. I grabbed that. And I, that was my show and tell. And I don't remember all the words I said when I was six or seven or whatever I was. But I remember showing this to my classmates and telling them about what God had done for me at such a young age. I was treated different. Felt different. Still different. Learned new words that I still don't know the meaning of. Things like Bible thumper, I still don't know what that means. <laughs> I mean, I've been called that so many times. I, st I, I still don't know what that means. So why are you here this morning? And I don't mean just on earth, I mean at church. Why are you here at church this morning? To experience the realness of God? Or is it just because this is where you come on a Sunday? It's where you're supposed to be. It's a routine. Or do we actively seek to further our relationship and to further our realness with God daily and not just on a Sunday? See, God wants to become real to each of you. He doesn't want to just be a name on a church. He just doesn't want to be a Bible story. He doesn't want to be something that your grandparents or your parents believed in. Rob talked about that last Sunday. He wants to be real, like really real to you. Are we pursuing that? There's a lot of a lot of fakeness in the world right now. A lot. It's funny, I, I, I think back to our kids growing up and, and uh, everybody remembers the little plastic fake food. The little plastic plates and the little fake kitchens and I don't remember who it was. I think it might have been the, the Barnetts that, that donated their plastic kitchen to us with all the fake food in it. And, uh, um, the, but the three older kids, Hannah and Jonas and, and Sierra, I remember that when I would be sitting and eating whatever they were serving me, they would watch to see if you ate it. But I was pretty good about the open hand and then, right, cup, and then it's still in my hand. And they were pretty convinced of that. But then Elise came along. <laughs> and she called my bluff. She's like, it's still in your hand. You didn't eat that. And she would make me open up my hand. And there was still that little plastic apple. She wanted to see it go into my mouth and me chew on a plastic apple. 
And, and it wasn't until that apple went into my mouth that she smiled. And she was like, okay, now I know that you ate it. A little bit too smart, Lise. So I chewed on a lot of plastic back in those days, so that probably explains a thing or two. But we don't want to serve a fake Jesus because Jesus isn't fake. There's only one Jesus, and it's the real one. There's a lot of fake news, there's fake people, there's fake politics, and dare I say, fake Christians. And they're all over the place. And they're not pointing towards the real God, because they don't know him. Jesus is real, he has to be real, and he has to be real to you and everywhere that you go. Whether it's church, work, school, and everything that you do, I hope that you experience the realness of God and that you show that to others. And I want to finish with two examples. Because I like to look at examples in my life of people that I think that are like really real. And it's when things get really real that you really find out the realness of God. One of those examples is David. And I think about God must have been pretty real in David's life at a young age. When David was a teenager, he went before this giant called Goliath. And he said to him, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. And you don't leave it at that. As a 14 or 15 or however old he was, talking to this massive giant, who the entire army was afraid, afraid of, cowering behind the line, afraid of. And he goes out with no armor, just his shepherd boy clothes and a sling. And he says, This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Did my mic just go off? <laughs> oh, okay. I will strike you down and cut off your head. That's what he says. That's what this teenager says to Goliath. Now, if I look at that story, and a lot of us have heard that story multiple times, that story alone speaks to the realness of God. There is nobody at any age that is going to go out and have the boldness to say what he said in the moment that he said it without knowing a hundred percent that God is with him. I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head. And then he did it. Exactly what he said he was going to do. Because he knew the realness of God. The other example that I want to share with you this morning is another teenager. And I've shared about my friend Randy before, but it's, it's always hard. David was at the age of 14 where he showed tremendous courage in the face of adversity. Uh, my friend Randy at the age of 14 was diagnosed with cancer. 
I knew my best friend in eighth grade. And he too showed incredible courage at such a young age. The same type of courage that David had. I remember talking to Randy as he was losing his battle and going through chemo and he was bald and went from this really strong athletic kid to literally just a bag of bones lying on a hospital bed. And I would just feel sorry for him. And I felt really helpless. I sit and talk to him, it's like the only thing I could do. And he said, Kevin, like, man, I've lived a really good life. Like a really good life. He's like, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry about any of it. He goes, I'll see you again. I know where I'm going. God's taken such good care of me, and he's going to continue to take good care of me. And at the age of 14, yeah, I had a relationship with God. But I can tell you, it wasn't as real as Randy's. I was blaming God for Randy's cancer. And the person that had it was thanking him. I knew I needed to be more real. Because it didn't matter what the day was like for Randy or for David or anybody that has that personal relationship with Christ. It could be your best day. It could be your worst day. It could be uh, just another day. But Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus is the same every day. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Good, bad, or indifferent. And that's the realness of Christ that I want for me. I want that so bad for me. I want that so bad for you to know Him every day in that same real, real way. So the next time, or maybe for some of the first time, that somebody says, how do you know God is real? But you have an answer. <coughs> Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for for being real and just for whether we believe it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we suppress it or not, that truth that you gave us, that you instilled in us from birth, God, I pray that we would stop suppressing that. That we would grow that. That we would continue to know you more. That we would pursue you each day, even on our bad days that when it's hard. That we would pursue you. And pursue the realness of Christ and just feel that presence, your real presence in us, in our lives and our hearts. And that we would be able to reach out and impact others and show others that realness, even when they're looking at your awesome and beautiful creation and they don't see you. They read your word and they, they're not getting it. They're being told about Jesus and they're just not understanding. God, I pray that we would remain diligent 
that we would remain courageous and bold as David and Randy and just know that you are real and know that you are good and we know that people are watching so that we would display that word without saying a word sometimes. I thank you for this church, for this congregation, and for this day. I pray that you bless these people in their lives as they leave this church and go into their week. In your name we pray. Amen. Just listened to that song for the first time this week. Um, but man, those words are awesome. 
few years ago, I was in Seattle for work, and um, I'm somebody supposed to say I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I just grabbed a quick plate of food that they had at the training center where I was working. It was like spaghetti, Caesar salad, and some garlic bread, you know, the classic. And it was on a paper plate, and I grabbed that and brought it out to my the work vehicle and put it on the passenger seat and took off because I wanted to beat traffic. And as I'm heading through Seattle towards the on-ramp, I looked over and thought, how in the world am I supposed to eat a plate of spaghetti and salad <laughs> while I'm driving on that time? Like, like this, like, that's, like why, like, why did I just go to all the trouble to throw all that food on there? I just, it was lunch time I was hungry, but now I'm like at this point where I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Um, and I'm in a company vehicle, so I, I probably shouldn't do that, right? Um, and at the time, I was also a safety consultant, so that wouldn't, be, <laughs> wouldn't have been good either. Um, but as I approached the on-ramp, it's one of those that has the red light, green light, you know, that meters the traffic on. And, um, there's a young man standing uh, at the on-ramp, um, thin, dirty, old, like tank top on, and he's holding the sign. And the only thing that the sign says is, the struggle is real. That's all it says. The struggle is real. And so I, and when I got my turn to pull up there, I had my window down, it was a nice day. And I just reached over and I grabbed that plate of food I knew I wasn't going to eat. <laughs> and I handed it out the window to him. And uh, his eyes lit up like crazy. And he proceeded to eat that plate of food faster than I think I've seen anybody eat a plate of spaghetti. Uh, he put down his sign and he just sat on the edge there and proceeded to eat. I didn't need to see that sign to know that his struggle was real. So my question for all of you today is how many of you need this? for other people to know that God is real in your life. And how many of you don't? Have an awesome week.